Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like you're Brandon Davies. You have consent. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. Also do that while you're here. Okay, let's get into it. We seem to have finally reached a slowdown period in college basketball's offseason. Not much going on. But we did get some important, unsurprising, but still important news this week when Duke point guard Jeremy Roach announced that he's returning to school for a fourth year of college basketball. This development had no impact on my top 25 and one because I've always had Jeremy Roach projected to return to Duke for a fourth season. So I, so I still have the Blue Devils fifth in the top 25 and one behind Kansas, UConn, Purdue, and Marquette, assuming, of course, that UConn brings back Andre Jackson, Tristan Newton, Purdue brings back Zach Eady, Marquette brings back every relevant player. Obviously, if those rosters, the projections change, then I'll change with them. But for now, I've got Duke ranked fifth. Regardless, there are some people, if not lots of people, insisting uh, that the Blue Devils should now be the preseason number one based on them returning the top four scores from a team that went 10 and 1 in its final 11 games and finished 18th at Ken Palm. So let me start here, dead leg. Where are you at on Duke? Preseason number 1 clear cut or maybe not? No, not not clear cut. I actually hope we're heading toward can we get, you know, can we get to an October where we have actual like interesting disagreement over who should be the number 1 team. We get that some off seasons, so don't get me wrong, but um, between Kansas, Connecticut, wait on Purdue with Edie. If he's back, they'll have a case. Duke, Marquette returning as much as it's returning. I think those are the teams I think that are in your top five in some sort of order. I think those are the five realistically in the conversation. It'd be wonderful, frankly, if you had one. Uh, Borzello had a different, the AP top 25 had, had one, Ken Palm had a different one, just, you know, uh, pick your, your top seven, eight, nine, different kind of preseason polls, rankings, whatever. And if we got some good disagreement there, and if we had a, a lack of group think, so I, I think there's a case now Roach returning, as you mentioned, it's not surprising. There is a case though, with flip back in particular, uh, because he could wind up being the could wind up being the player of the year. He'll be on that list of five to 10 most likely candidates to do so. Roach returning and considering the position he plays, I think that's really, uh, really important. Proctor, I think, should, should have the type of, of season where if he really grows as a sophomore, uh, Tyrese Proctor being like a top 20 pick next year would not stun me because I think he does have that kind of ceiling. And then Mark Mitchell's back as well. It's also, it's it's a big it's a big development for Duke in that they are returning. Uh, They're returning, you know, four starters from the season before, which brings me before we get your thoughts. On this, I have a trivia time for you. OK, let's go. All right, here we go. So Duke is going to return four starters year over year. That does not happen often. Trivia time. OK. When's the last time year to year that Duke returned at least four starters? I'm going to say it would be Grayson Allen's junior year. It was not Grayson Allen's junior year, but let's look up Grayson Allen's junior year real quick. Should have been Grayson Allen's junior year. Grayson Allen's junior year. Grayson Allen going into his junior year or going into his senior year? Like what was what's the going back? going into his junior year? All right, going into Grayson Allen's junior year, he came back. Uh, that team had freshman Jason Tatum on it. It had sophomore Luke Kennard. It had freshman Frank Jackson. Had senior Emil Jefferson. Had senior Matt Jones. Uh, did not have four returning starters. You want one more guess? I do want one more guess. It'll be the year that Nolan Smith came back after winning a national championship. You are close. But if literally the head coach of Duke men's basketball is to be believed because he is the source of this information, because I asked him, he said, John Shire texted me and said the last time it happened was 09-2010 national championship winning Duke team. Lance Thomas, Kyle Singler, Nolan Smith and Shire all returned. And then 
Um, Brian Zubek and, and, and Lance Thomas, they both started like uh, Zubek started 17 games. Thomas started 16. So it's like six and one half dozen, whoever you're picking. According to Shire, 0910 was the last time a Duke team brought back at least four starters. That Duke team won the national championship. Of course, it was coached by Krzyzewski, not Shire, who was on the roster there. So we'll see. There's a case to make them the preseason number one team. But I do take into account that Shire's and he's in year two of this. And last year he was given, you know, appropriate grace period. You know, there, there were real expectations. Don't get me wrong. But it was also, OK, let's see how this thing's going to go with John Shire. With these freshmen that are coming in, yeah, they had they had Roach who returned, which which was which was big. But they had a talented recruiting class, but it was a young team, and then they faced a lot of injuries. Now, you are going to have a team that will have Final Four expectations, be picked to win the ACC, and it's going to have this temperature in the air of like, okay, now we're like we're back to how it was for you know eighty percent of the existence we had under Mike Krzyzewski. The, there will be like real pressure with that. I don't anticipate any kind of like UNC type 23, 24 season for Duke with what UNC just did. I don't think that's coming, but I don't put it out of the realm of possibility that with that much pressure and anticipation, and now it's like, Oh, Shire didn't suck in year one. Now this team's automatically going to be a top five team in the country. We have to allow for some, some variants and possibilities that just because you have all these guys returning doesn't necessarily ensure you to be one of the three or four or five best teams in the country. That being said, I wouldn't put them number one, but they are inarguably, inarguably like top five conversation heading in because of the talent, what they have coming in and the proven experience and Roach running that offense, I think will be pretty key. To your point, returning four guys like this, I guess guarantees nothing, but boy, it's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. It's a great place to start. You got four guys who all averaged at least nine points per game last season for a team that again, dealt with injuries and other things early in the season, but eventually got good. They got legitimately good. They were 10 and one in their final 11 games, finished 18th at Ken pop. So I don't have any issue with anybody ranking them. Number one. I actually think that we will probably get to a preseason AP poll. That's got three or four, maybe even five different teams getting first place votes. Yeah. I think we could have put that to rest. If, McKenzie and Baco would have picked Kansas. I think at that point, pretty much everybody would have gone Kansas number one. We'll get to Mbako later. But um, I still have Kansas number one. I could reasonably, I think you can reasonably take Kansas, UConn, Purdue, Marquette, and Duke and put them in pretty much any order, any order. And so I know you might go, Okay, some people have Duke number one and you got a number five, but like I don't think there's much difference between these schools. And the only ones I have above Duke right now are schools with either a coach who is consistently awesome or a roster that has already a projected roster that has already proven to be awesome. So let's just run through it real quick. Kansas, I've got number one. I believe KU right now has one of the best rosters in America and the best coach. That's a great combination. Jayhawks have been a number one seed in 10 of the past 16 NCAA tournaments. I'm going to trust them to be awesome again. So that's one of the teams I got ahead of Duke. The next one, UConn. And that's based on them returning four of the top six scores from a national championship team and then adding a top five recruiting class. That's easy to understand. But not, but not there yet. That's the, no, no, just so people are clear. Yeah, yeah. We're still waiting on, I believe, a couple of decisions, right? Yeah. I'm projecting Jackson Newton back. If one of them or both of them stay in the draft, I'll adjust. You know, I'm already up to version 12.0. I can get to 13 just like that. Just give me 20 minutes. I can update this. It's no big problem. So if UConn's projected roster looks different than I'm projecting it right now, then Duke will move ahead of them. I promise you. But for now, based on that projection, nothing crazy about having UConn slightly ahead of them. Purdue. I've got Purdue projected right now to return six of the top seven scores, including Zach Eady from a team that won the Big Ten and the Big Ten tournament and secured a one seed in the NCAA tournament. I know how it ended, but, like, I know how it ended. Enough of you have tweeted me to, to remind me how it ended. Not going to stop. I know. I know. But, like, I'm just not going to overreact to one bad game. I hear you. That team was great all – they weren't great all year. They were great at the beginning, and then they yeah, a little got a little, a little bit like that. But they were ultimately – they were a one seed that won the Big Ten and the Big Ten tournament. Yep. They're, they're – they're, Expecting them to be really good again is not crazy. And then Marquette, you know, basically returning everybody from a team that won the Big East, won the Big East tournament, had a two-seed in the NCAA tournament. So those are the only four teams 
I have currently projected ahead of Duke, and they're all proven. Bill Self, proven. UConn's projected roster, proven. Purdue's projected roster, proven. Marquette's projected roster, proven. But again, if you want to start Duke at number one, totally okay with me because I see it. I understand it. They will probably start those four guys that I mentioned, Filipowski, Roach, Proctor, Mitchell, all Mm -hmm. of whom averaged at least nine points per game last season. And then they got a five-star freshman, Jared McCain, who probably slides right into that starting lineup. And boy, you've got a nice, a nice mixture of legitimate NBA talent and guys who have already been through it, who are experienced. And that is whether you take 2015 uh, Duke, 2012 Kentucky, everybody remembers the one and dones. But as a point I've made a million times, three of the top six scores on each of those teams were non-freshmen. This Duke team is going to have the five-star freshmen, and they're going to have the NBA talent, but they're going to be relying on guys who are, you know, in many cases in their second, third, fourth year of college. And that's a what John's got available to him right now is the recipe for winning a national championship. If Proctor actually makes the jump, uh, man, then that's where I think things really change for Duke. Because I expect Roach to be what he's been, maybe a notch better, but he's been he's been pretty he's been pretty good, and he should improve. And and having his leadership, you know, to have a, a this is how it was for for so long as you well know, GP, but to have a high level, anywhere from top ten to top thirty high school prospect last in a good way for four years in college coaches will take that every single time Duke gets that with Roach flip outperformed expectations and then Mitchell there's there's just so much promise here and by the way they bring back Ryan Young who was like one of the three most important players for the first 12 game of Duke, 12 games of Duke season last season. Jalen Blakes is back and he'll be like a role player. But you mentioned McCain. They're going to have an overload of guards here. So Sean Stewart is a top 20 guy. He'll get minutes. TJ Power is a top 20 level kind of guy. He'll, you would think, come in and depending on how they deploy young, like he can just get spot minutes for, for Mitchell or Flip. Um, and then Caleb Foster is the only four-star guy here in the mix there. Uh, we'll see actually how liberal Shire wants to get with his minutes because he will not be hurting uh, for bodies here. They're actually, uh, they appear, now we'll look up on Valentine's Day and we'll see how many guys are actually logging 15 plus minutes per game. But the roster itself is pretty, is pretty deep overall and appears to be, what's interesting is it appears to have, you know, all the spots that you'd want, but, and the bigs will be, be productive, but between Proctor, Roach, uh, Blake, even like Jaden Shuck comes back, he didn't play, but is he going to increase there? And then you've got, what, Stewart, Kane Foster. You've got a lot of guards and wings there, so I would anticipate um, a lot of three-guard looks. In fact, probably all the time, to be honest with what they have here. They'll, they'll run nothing but three-guard looks and then a couple of bigs there. And, yeah, Duke is back. It never left, but, uh, but here we go. Let's go. So we were actually talking about this on my the Gary Paris show earlier, and I asked my producer, who's like a casual college basketball fan, I was like, hey, do people still hate Duke? When you hear, when I'm telling you Duke might be preseason number one, do you go, God, I hate them? Or is that done? Did that die with Mike Krzyzewski retiring? And he said, no, he still hates Duke. Yeah, it's still out there. It's still out there? I yeah. like Duke. I like Duke. Yeah. Great, great academic institution. Come on, Duke. Smart young head coach. I like blue. I don't hate Duke. Does that put me in the minority? I'm fine with Duke. Um, no, just it's it's constantly polarizing. It is what it is. Now the with Shashevsky leaving, it's not it's not what it once was. Uh, but there's always going to be an element of that there, and that's ultimately obviously good for college basketball. We want to have programs that represent a villain, even if you know, John. Sh- John Shire does not look the role of a villain not like or act like, the role of a villain or, or, or anything, but it is. He does all is, his, he, he does right. all his own half court, halftime interviews. Uh, how about that? Does yeah, all his right. halftime interviews. He's just like, I tell, I tell people all the time. Like if you knew John Shire, you would like him. He's likable. He's a likable guy. He's got a beautiful family. I love Duke. I mean, in fact, I want to establish, I, it's not that I, I don't Duke. hate Duke. I love Duke. All right, there we go. Hit there me that go. button. Hit me that button. Hit what me a button. Well, what, I mean, I, I got a lot here. Defense. Come on, Duke. That's Let's the one. Go. 
Yeah, got, I got four of them loaded. Let's go do it. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, no, I think it is good for the sport, though, to have Duke be, you know, near the top of the polls and have have fans root against something, some sort of monolith there. Sometimes it's Kentucky. Sometimes it's Duke. That's usually the two programs. But uh, but Indiana can get in there sometimes. And maybe, maybe they're just working their way back because they just picked up a player that decommitted, wouldn't you know, from Duke. So a nice little plot this twist there, huh, GP? It's always nice when a Blue Blood program can land a guy who wasn't going to be good enough to play at the other Blue Blood program. Congratulations to the Hoosiers. We'll talk about that next. First, a word. <laughs> from our partners <laughs> one weekend in may only the best are welcome an invitation reserved for legendary players and future stars challenging each other at one of the most extraordinary courses in the nation a major moment awaits the pga championship on cbs so there's this high school player named uh, uh, McKenzie Mbaco, and he was uh, signed and ready to go to Duke, and then he realized he wasn't going to be able to play at Duke, so he had to find a new place. And that new place? Indiana. He's going to be a Hoosier. Maybe he'll be the, the key to getting this Blue Blood program back to the Final Four, even the Elite Eight for the first time since 2002. What do you think? Um, I'm not going to put that much on the young man's shoulders, but yes. Uh, he picked – by the way, picked Indiana – over Kansas, I, I thought this was the right decision because he left Duke because Flip returned, right? And then Kansas gets Dickinson. And, and Baco, these, you know, his, his position, what he does, isn't exactly A to A and, and B to B with with what Flip does and, and with what Dickinson does. But, you know, he's, he's six foot eight. He played on the EYBL circuit on DJ Wagner's team. And so I've seen him play a, a ton. And unquestionably, there were some games where you'd watch him play and be like, I understand why Wagner's number one player in the class, but this dude's having the best game of anyone on the floor right now. And, you know, he he's really, really, really good and probably necessary addition for Indiana to continue you know, cresting in the right direction. He averaged 16 and a half points and 7.6 rebounds on the EYBL circuit with the scholars there. Again, playing with um, someone who might well be one of the best point guards in the sport next season in Wagner there. But for Woodson to get this done, and I can't help but think that the career of Trace Jackson Davis also played a role, although Mbako has no designs on, on being a four-year player the way that Ch Jackson Davis was. He certainly can. He's going to step into Jackson Davis's role. He's a better overall shooter and is more reliable from the mid to, to deep range than, than Jackson Davis was. Uh, but getting him, man, that's a big one. I got another trivia time for you. Okay, let's go. Trivia time. Two, two, 2002, last time Indiana was in a Elite Eight. It was more than two decades ago. 2002. That's my and answer. They made the title game, of course. That's my answer. And Baco is the highest rated recruit to commit to Indiana and ultimately play there since who you don't have to go crazy. You don't have to go back to Oh two. It's been, it's been more recent than that. Who do you think was the last recruit rated as high or higher to play for the Hoosiers and no cheating in the chat. I'm not looking right now, but uh, I would imagine that the chat might be able to get this as well. Oh, it's one of them brothers. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to interpret that answer. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know what I mean? The brothers who, from Indiana. Okay. What are their names? I can't even think of them right what now. What are their names? Zzz. 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 Zellers. The Zellers. Zellers. That would be incorrect. It has been oh, more recently than Cody Zeller. I went through all that <laughs> for that. I went, all, I went through all that just to be wrong. You did. I was thinking more Cody guess. Zeller. This is, this, is get, this is gettable. I, this player's recruitment was as intensely followed of any Indiana recruit since Zeller. I mean, so it's somewhere between Cody Zeller. Don't look at the chat. It's in there. Don't I'm look not, at no, the no, chat. I'm not, look, I'm not looking at it. It's some, in between Jalen Huchifino. It's between those two. Correct. It's, it's happened in between. Oh, God, I know. The little, the little shooter, Romeo. Romeo Lankford. Yeah. Romeo Lankford was and I, seventh. I, and I swear to God on my kid's life, I did not look at the chat. Romeo Lankford was seventh in the class of 2018, was the recruit that, you know, basically Archie Miller's tenure was built around. And Baco's the highest rated recruit since him. If you're wondering, Trace was 28th overall and was a four-star player. I got one more trivia time for you. Okay, let's go. 
in the two four seven sports era. Mm -hmm. And so that goes like and some of these are, I guess, retroactively applied. But let's just say it's basically the past 25 years with Indiana basketball. Okay, so late 90s. There have been four. You might say only four. Yeah, only four. Only four top ten. Only four for Indiana. Only four Indiana basketball for Indiana. I I reject the premise. There is no way a program as great as Indiana that last went to the Elite Eight in 2002 only has four top ten recruits in this entire database. I reject the premise. That's impossible. I I remind you of a conversation we had. I think in March of 22, when we discovered that Indiana like had not made the big 10 semi since like 2002, again, like same deal. We're like, there's no way this is possible. It's not so even Indiana possible. Basketball. It, 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 Capable, Indiana basketball is too yes. good for I reject the premise. There's no way this is true. Kentucky gets like four top 10 guys every other year. There's no way Indiana only has four in the past quarter. I'm century. going off of what two, four, seven sports. I know, me. but you don't oh, understand. There's no, this way, podcast started, there is so. no way a program could okay. own four top 10 recruits in a quarter century and have a fan base that tweets as much as the fan base tweets. So I reject the premise. I just don't think it's, it can't possibly be true. Cause if you, were fan, if you were a fan of a program that never gets top 10 recruits and hasn't been to the elite eight since 2002 and has underachieved relative to preseason expectations each of the past two years, there's no way you'd be popping off all the time like that. Mm. Uh, so I, re- I reject the premise. I doubt it's true. All right. Well, nonetheless, I have four names here. We've named three of them. So four top 10 recruits in the past 25-ish years for IU. Rename the three. Who are the three? Romeo Langford. Yes. Cody Zeller. Yes. And the guy we're talking this about. This fella. Mbako. Who's the fourth? The fourth is probably committed to play under Tom Crean. If you'd like a little cheat, I would like a cheat. The only name that pops into my head is OG Ananobi. I know it's not him. Oh, it's not. I wonder where OG was ranked. I'll look that up real quick. He was. Uh, he was like. I think he was just a guy. I think, I think he, he was, was just a guy. Jag. I'm looking right now. Um, OG two twenty one. Two twenty one in the class of. Jeez, what was his class here? Hold on. What about the big fella? You might be on something. Class of 15 for Ananobi. I would have actually thought like 12 or 13. Time's flying. Yeah, the big fella. What's his name? Chat's got it. Don't look. I'm not looking. Man, this chat thing, it changes the dynamic of trivia. Vonley. Correct. Noah Vonley is the only other top 10 prospect to commit and play at IU in the past. I reject the premise. There's no right. way that's true. And according to the Daily Hoosier, Mbako's the 32nd player. Oh, I am looking at the chat now, and you missed somebody because Eric Gordon was obviously a top 10 prospect. Uh, Eric Gordon, he was. <laughs> he was very much. Uh, why didn't it have it? 247. Call Eric Gordon was a top 10 player. Eric Gordon was awesome. He was like the number two player, was he not? He was up there. It was, they were all mixed up that year. It was like O.J. Mayo, Kevin Love, Eric Gordon, Derek Rose, Michael Beasley. Yeah, that class was awesome. awesome. Gordon, man, yeah. Talk about uh, – it was basically – yeah, just – No, the, the famous the famous yeah. grassroots thing out at Foothill. Yes. We went to Foothill. Yeah, like Foothill. That was before early, my time, but yes. Early on a cool. Sunday morning, and it was Derek Rose, Eric Gordon against O.J. Mayo and Bill Walker. I think you can find it on YouTube. Okay, then. Well, there's there's five. 32 players have been high, have been uh, McDonald's All-Americans to play at Indiana since that event started. And Bonko is the 32nd. He is the first since Trace Jackson Davis. Also, Indiana will have Khalil Ware, Oregon transfer, also McDonald's All-American. So it'll be the first time since James Blackman Jr. and Thomas Bryant six years ago that IU actually rosters to McDonald's All-Americans. So a big get. By the way, I don't think we mentioned this. Mbako committed late on a Friday in May. Um, so uh, not, not one for high publicity, I guess, following in Bronny James's footsteps. Here is what Indiana is looking at next season. Bringing in Baco and Ware, big-time players. Um, Malik Renault will return, Trey Galloway. Xavier Johnson got cleared, so he's expected to be back, which I think will be significant. And then they bring in... You know, some transfers, a guy from Ball State who averaged 13.3 points per game, Peyton Sparks, Anthony Walker 
from Miami, who was just a bit player there. They've got a, a recruit, like a top 80 guy coming in, and Gabe Cups, and along with Ja'Kai Newton, who's a four-star player there. So they have pieces. The question is, Gary Parrish, mm -hmm. do you have Indiana ranked, or does Mbako's addition not even get you there? Because I think getting Mbako is the piece that gives Indiana fans hope that this can continue, as I said to start this, in the right direction. You know, year one was solid. Year two was a little bit better. They almost broke through, but didn't get through the second weekend. They ran into Final 14 Miami there. Um, heading into next season, I don't think you can ask this team to be too much better than it was last season, but at least Mbako, who I think has a chance to be one of the five most productive freshmen in the country, I think this was borderline necessary for Woodson to make sure that the momentum is still going in the right direction. I do not have Indiana ranked. Do you agree with me? If he would have committed to Kansas, it would be almost unanimous. Number one, Kansas. Uh, yeah, probably. Yes. Right. Cause I, I think, uh, especially if Mbako's deployed the right way and used the right way. That's the, that's why I want to see what happens here at IU. Uh, yeah. That, I think KU probably needs to be, although I'm never a fan of unanimous number ones because we see how that can backfire. But, from a practical standpoint, it would have been hard to argue against the Jayhawks, but that's not where we're at. I do not have Indiana in the top 25 and one, but I do think like if things break the right way, they've got a, like a legitimate chance to be the second best team in their state. Again, I think Indiana, if everything goes the right way, can be the second best men's basketball team in the state again. Okay. Gosh. I think that's on the table. Like, I don't think that's, setting the bar too high like can you indiana iu be the second best basketball team in the state of indiana i think so do I you think, think so i do i do i think, I that's think they can do that and i don't think that's is that setting the bar too high for them would indiana fans be like come on gp don't get unreal i think you can be the second best team in the state of indiana wow I'm trying to, you know, this commitment happened, what, four days ago. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to give IU fans a little bit of love on the show. Talk about their big, their big get that's going to have them, you know, believing they can be a factor in the Big Ten race. And here you are. I try, Indiana fans. Listen, continue to listen to the show. I'm, I'm, I'm working as best I can for you, but you see what I'm up against here. I think, no, I mean, like, listen. There was a time where I think Indiana – would set out to try to be the best bas men's basketball team in the state of Indiana every year, right? That, that We lived through that. We remember that. We're old enough to remember that. Uh -huh. And so, you know, over, over time, things change. I still think they can compete to finish in the top two, depending on what, you know, obviously depending on what's going on with the Sycamores. I think they could be well, top one two. of the greatest players in the history of the game literally did leave Indiana to play for Indiana State. So there's also that. Let's um okay. Is it true that Indiana has underachieved each of the past two seasons? Underachieved? Is well, it true? That, that, no. Well, they, it, it, well, in 2022, they started 30th at Ken Palm and they finished 48th. And in 2023, they started 12th at Ken Palm and finished 30th. Wow. So is it okay. true wow. that Indiana has underachieved each of the past two seasons? I guess according to Ken Palm, it's true. You can according to on. Ken Palm, it's true. I don't feel like Indiana underachieved last season. It it what? Like I'm 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 clearly just goofing around this whole bit. This is a whole I'm just goofing around. Here's the, here's the big but picture. Yes, they underachieved. What are you talking I mean, about? They they finished tied for second in the Big Ten. They had the second best player in the country. They got a four seed and went up against the final four team and played them well and won 23 games in their second season under Mike Woodson. I don't feel like it was an underachieving season for Indiana. I feel like they they might have hit the mark of what was reasonably expected. You there thought that they underachieved? I'm not even I'm not even like joking. This isn't a bit. Like I feel like they kind of leveled out where they should have last season. Okay. I and they didn't have Xavier Johnson. Like I, I don't I don't I don't Jalen Hutchinson you know, is going to be like first round pick. I don't know. I I don't have too many issues. I mean, I'll just keep it simple. They were projected to win the Big 10. They didn't. They started 12th at Kim Palm and finished 30th. What are you talking about? That's underachieving. Right. Okay. I mean, in what world is that not underachieving? I didn't pick Indiana to win the Big Ten. So I guess in my – how about this? For my own expectations, I didn't I didn't have Indiana lofted that high. I saw, I, I saw the bigger picture. I knew it was actually possible and, and achievable, and I didn't uh, – I didn't, I didn't hold them to that kind of – I thing. believed in them. I picked Indiana to win the Big Ten. I believed in them. But, like, you know what? That's on me. That's on me. Fool me once. Mm. Shame on you. Fool me twice. 
Shame on me. I don't know if Indiana can get back to the Elite Eight for the first time in more than 20 years with McKenzie. And that and should not be the expectation with this roster. Yeah. It should but, not. But can you finish second in your own state? I think that's possible. Can we can we can we actually swerve this conversation real quick to the thing that I texted you about? Because Indiana applies to this, this topic. Sure, swerve. Okay. So Kevin Clark covers uh covers the NFL. I think Formula One does a bunch of stuff for the ringer. Slow news day. Great writer. Really good dude. He tweeted something on Monday where he got into talking about because Andy Staples wrote a story for The Athletic about the state of Florida football and Florida Gators football, where it is now, what, what it was, you know, for the better part of 20 years or so and how Florida's kind of just it's it's gotten to a place where it's actually you could argue that it is in some ways resembling Indiana basketball, I suppose, but that's not the point of that piece. So then Kevin Clark uh, springs off of that and says, this is not what Florida should, should be. This is, shouldn't be their expectations. It's, it's unacceptable. You're in, you're in a, you're in arguably, you know, the t- most talent rich state in the country uh, for, for college football prospects. You can't be this if you're Florida. So he tweeted out here are my quote, no excuses jobs where you should compete for a conference title Every single year after after year one of a coaching hire. So at, you get one year of a grace period. But by year two, if you're at one of these 12 programs in college football, you are competing for a conference title. Those 12 schools, according to Kevin Clark, are Texas, Southern California, Florida, LSU, Georgia, Miami, Florida State, Alabama, Michigan, Oklahoma, Ohio State, and Penn State. He said, given the talent base, you have no real excuses. Now, to me, in ba- we're going to do this for basketball. Compete for a conference title, to me, means that you are in the top three in your league standings, maybe four, but really top three of your league standings basically every season, and you are winning a conference regular season championship at least once every three years. That's what this means. That's what, what I equate to what Clark put out there. But before I give you mine, there are 80 schools that are going to be in big six leagues as of July 1. 80 what? of them. 80 schools are in big six leagues. Do you have a list of what schools this should apply to? No excuses. Year two, you are competing for regular season championships in the big six leagues. I got my list ready. Do you have a list ready, GP? I do not have a list ready. Okay, I, I have thought, a list. Because I, I, thought we, I thought we agreed not to talk about this. <laughs> I have the list. This okay. this fight. And because we'll get out here faster. I have the list. And then you tell me if you d- agree or disagree. Okay. okay. That might be the way to do this. Okay. I've got 13 schools out of 80 that I think apply to this. All right. Again, doesn't matter the coach. By year two in college basketball, you are competing for a regular season championship. We're not talking Final Four as a national champion. Regular season. All right. In the ACC, I've got three schools that I think this applies to Carolina, Duke. Of course. And yes, Louisville. Louisville is a top 10 all-time program, and it's coming off its worst season ever. But Louisville absolutely applies this. Before I go to the next conference, would you agree with that list? Would you take anyone off? Would you put anyone on? I think those three absolutely should be on there. The one that I would wonder, like, and this is based off of peak Jim Beheim, but Syracuse, could Syracuse be on that list? We'll, so I thought about this with Syracuse. Will we expect Syracuse in the second year under Red Autry to compete for an ACC regular season championship? I don't think that we will. And the fact that I think there's hesitation means that Syracuse should not be on the list. Fine with me. Okay. Can I can I throw a query out here? Hmm. Hello, Nada. Hello. Um, where's how far was away was Virginia in this? I, I mean, thought about uh, Virginia, but I think that's a Tony Bennett job. Correct. Decently far. Now, this topic in particular, if you've been listening to all our offseason episodes, we did a, a we did a segment a few shows back where we talked about uh, we had it was the mailbag episode where coach where people someone asked you know what uh programs and the and the head coach how much is this is current program responsible for a success because it's tied to the head coach and we thought and when we listed however many it was 10 to 12 of them virginia was on that list if your team is on the list it's hard to be on that list your head coach is so responsible for your success and also be on this list because this is more program institution is bigger than the person that's actually running it so Um, I did think about Virginia, and I did think about Syracuse, but I've only got UNC, Duke, Louisville applying in this scenario. All right? Fine with me. me. Big East, there's only two, and you know the two, GP. Okay, what's going to be UConn? Yep. 
and the school that has won, like oh Villanova, yeah, yeah. it's UConn Villanova. Now, what's interesting about I was this, wondering if you might put Georgetown on the list. Like, if you're the right guy at Georgetown, can you get that thing flipped quick? It, it has does it? Ha, it has deteriorated so much at that program that it is not in the conversation right now. If we had done this podcast segment eight years ago, I think we would have put Georgetown on it. But time can can really wear away at that. Don't I can't put Georgetown on the list there. What's interesting about this is with Villanova, this is what we have. Like Kyle Neptune is going into his second season. And the expectation for that program will, will be that they compete for the Big East regular season title. That is the expectation there. And short of that, so top three in the league is unacceptable. Villanova is in that category. Obviously, UConn is in that category. No one else in the Big East, I think, fits that bill. Big 10 is where it gets spicy and interesting. I'll give you my, I have three. Okay. You could argue for fewer, you could argue for more. For me, the three are Tom Izzo leaves Michigan State at the end of the season. Whoever replaces them, replaces them. They get one year. Michigan State fans will expect that program to be competing for a Big Ten regular season title by year two. Michigan State's on the list. Indiana is on the list. Hell, we just saw it. It was just year two for Mike Woodson. And as we just talked about, they were expected to compete for a regular season title. They ultimately did. And then I put Ohio State on the list as well. I do not have. I do not. Let's let's just hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We will hold on. I do not have Purdue, and I do not have Michigan. I think those are the two others that you can argue should be in there. If you're going to go against me on Ohio State, I'm very fascinated to see why. But MSU, IU, OSU are my three teams from the Big Ten. I will acknowledge that Indiana should be on this list. I reject that Indiana competed for a conference championship last season. They finished three games back. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. They didn't compete they, for anything they last tied season. For second. They finished tied for second. I, I can rephrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They finished tied for – It's like you're racing – who was that swimmer? Katie Ledecky. Katie Ledecky. It's like you finished second to Katie Ledecky, but like 75 yards back. Okay. I mean, we'll give Purdue's you a silver medal. Hoops, I, God love Matt Painter. Purdue basketball has nothing on the dominance of Katie Ledecky. Let's be we'll clear. give you a silver medal, but like you weren't competing for gold. Indiana got a silver medal. My last point season. was that heading into his second season. Oh, yeah. Th- the expectation was Indiana would compete for the Big Ten regular season championship. Oh, okay, good. good. Say that again. Say that again. The expectation. the expectation. Okay. And the expectation finished, was that they, they finished would, three games back. Well, that's three, what actually happened. One, okay. one two, three games back. And you don't think they underachieved? To my own expectations, they didn't, because I, I had them finishing fourth in the league. So. You had them finishing three games back of Indiana? I mean, of I Purdue? Did. I did, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. I had Purdue. I believed I had, in them more than that. I had Illinois winning the league. I believed, <laughs> I, I believed in them. <laughs> no, okay. Indiana. I'll go Indiana. Yes. I'll go Michigan State, just because they've yeah. been good my whole life. Yes, that, that clearly they are on the list. You had so your Ohio third. State. Ohio State. Okay, but like I think you can also put Michigan on there. I think you can also put Maryland on there. Maryland, no. Maryland, no. Not not and not in its current conference footprint. I understand Maryland's a really good program, but like, is okay. We are literally in this right now. Kevin Willard is going into his second season at Maryland. Is the expectation at Maryland this season that they will be one, two, three in the conference, and that's where it sh- absolutely should be? I don't feel like that's the temperature. Of that. Now, trust me, I understand there is a faction of the Maryland fan base that is like this, but I don't feel as though the pressure surrounding Kevin Wheelard in his second season at that job in that conference is quite at that level. Are you, are you suggesting Kevin Wheeler is not the right guy for the job? Not at all. Hmm. Not at all. I think I think Maryland's close. To, if Maryland's not on the list, they're close. I, I close? acknowledge Maryland is close. Yes. All right. I think I don't know. I don't understand how Michigan couldn't be on there. I mean, it's the, it's Michigan for crying out loud. Can you have six schools in one conference? Have this be the situation though? Because uh, that also this feels like a semi-exclusive kind of club. And Michigan had plenty of seasons in which it was down. Okay. I let's, don't know let's, if Michigan's there. Let, let's 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 put it let's put it to a test. Juwan Howard retires. Yeah. You take First a, all, you got him retire. Is he what? He's 49. <laughs> yeah, he might just Don't be over. He's he's financially secure enough to do so, but 
and you make a good hire at Michigan, you don't think that guy should be competing for the Big Ten title in year two? I do. I I do. To be fair, on this list, the my I have a note. My school that it was closest to being on it that I kept off was Michigan. That's the that's the the the, the cutoff. Yes. Okay, so we agree on Indiana, Michigan State, and Ohio State. I'm saying Maryland and Michigan, if they're not on the list, they're very close. We can agree yeah, on that. I think that's fair. All right. Big 12. Big 12. Only two. Kansas, Kansas and, Texas. and Texas. That's it. That's it. Yeah. No one else in the Big 12 reasonably are you expected to actually compete for the first of all, it's Kansas. It's really just Kansas. But yeah. Texas, and this is going to change. And let's get into this now. Texas is in the Big 12 now. It's going to the SEC. Is that still the situation at Texas in the SEC for basketball? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Is it? Is it? I mean, like there's only one conference champion and look at all the t- ridiculous schools you're going to have in the SEC. So is is this situation still going to apply to Texas in two years? I think I and I know that the, the history of the program does not back this up. But I think if you are awesome at this job and you're the Texas coach, you should be competing for championships every year. OK, I think that's fair. I have Texas on the list. Pac-12. Does this apply? I have UCLA and Arizona because it's obviously those are the only two in that conference. I don't think this applies to UCLA when it goes to the Big Ten. It's super weird. Geographic disparity. There's going to be other factors with this job. UCLA fans will want to probably keep it there. I'm not going to reject that. But I don't know if me personally, I don't know if I expect UCLA. Granted, I know who's the coach there, but I don't know if I'm going to expect UCLA to compete for the Big Ten regular season championship every single year. I got to see how this is going to work. This is first still off, weird. first off, like it. Nobody competes for it every year except Bill Self and Mark Few. So that's too no, high. I don't, Mark. Well, compete is you're in the top three pretty much almost every year. That was the parameter that I laid out at the time. Even if you're tied for no, second three games good. back. Yeah. Even if you're tied for second three games back to a superior school in your own state. Yeah. The whole point is 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 there's no excuses. The infrastructure in place at the program, recruiting territory, NIL, facilities, anything. There are no excuses. By year two, you are at the top or near the top of your ledger in your conference play. No excuses. Arizona's going to remain there. I have UCLA there, obviously, in the Pac-12 now. In the Big Ten, I think that's going to be interesting. It's a super wild card there. Well, yeah, we'll have to see how the, you know, plenty of coaches who have been in charge of programs that change leagues. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going from the Big East to the ACC or from this to that. They will tell you that the impact on recruiting um, is can can be dramatic and that, I mean, I don't want to speak for Mike Bray, but I think he would tell you that it was easier to get people to come to Notre Dame to play in the Big East than it was to get people to come to Notre Dame to play in the ACC. Um, Obviously, when UConn went to the American, that was a, you know, they, I know they won a championship, but that, that was not the same as being in the Big East. So will will UCLA moving to the Big Ten impact the type of regional prospect UCLA has traditionally gotten? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. But I don't know for sure, but I don't think so. I think UCLA is going to be good in the Pac-10. In the I mean, Pac-10? Big, yeah. yeah. I think there's yeah, a chance. Right. I, I like Big UCLA. 10. Big Ten. I think Big they're going 10. to three Final Fours in three years, personally. Um, last one is SEC. I only have Kentucky. Michigan and Florida were my two cutoffs. Todd Golden is about to enter his second season at Florida. Who were your two cutoffs? Michigan and Florida were the two closest cutoffs for me. And the Southeastern Conference? No, overall. Overall. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> the uh, real life is getting wacky folks i don't even know anymore i can't keep up <laughs> it is it's in yeah there's even more stuff we're not even getting to that acc nonsense right now but anyway um todd golden's going into year two in florida and while florida fans would like to get back to the level it was once at uh you know in, in kind of going back to that staple story between football and basketball it's actually a pretty interesting time there for florida and there's there's optimism but like they've got to get back like a notch or two back uh, up from where they once were i don't know if that's the case like florida's not expected to be first second or third in that league and while fans would like that to be the case it doesn't feel like there's this like angst around it so i cut florida off because it literally it literally applies this upcoming season and florida doesn't fit the bill so to me the only school where this applies is kentucky and the sec Disagree? 
I might want to put Arkansas on the list. Maybe, but the program didn't make a Sweet 16 from 1996 to 2021. So I don't know. I mean, Indiana hasn't been to the Elite Eight since 2002. Oh I'll put them back in. 2002. I would hear an argument for Arkansas, but I just don't know if that's... Buddy, I was having premarital sex in 2002. The last time Indiana... <laughs> First off, look at me. Look how old I am. All right? Now, now keep it... Now, now, consider this. The last time Indiana was in the Elite Eight, I was actively having premarital sex. What do you want me to do? Prior to Mus, the market. Okay. <laughs> I've been going there. Okay, that's my 13. Carolina, Duke, Louisville, Yukon, Nova, Michigan State, Indiana, Ohio State, Kansas, Texas, UCLA, Arizona, Kentucky. No excuses. Competing for conference titles every year after year one. The only schools that apply to Kevin Clark's list in mine, Texas and Ohio State are the only ones in football and men's basketball where that is the actual case. Michigan, Florida were my two cutoffs. Any closing thoughts? Nope, I don't have them. I'm out of thoughts. All right, let's get out of here on this. <laughs> <laughs> let's get out of here on this because we're going to, first of all, I'm going to be with, Perry. if you're watching live on YouTube, smash that like button like you're Brandon Davies, please. Paris and I are going to be on CBS Sports HQ later on Tuesday night running through Parrish's what? mock draft. What? Yeah, after the draft lottery. We're going to be on a, a draft special, 9 to 10 Eastern on CBS Sports HQ. You'll be able to watch that on YouTube afterward and a variety of places. It'll be a really fun time. Adam Finkelstein, Avery Johnson will also be a part of that. I tweeted shortly before we went, went live. There's five teams that have the most likely odds to get number one and win the Wemby sweepstakes. Those are Detroit, Houston, San Antonio, each at 14% apiece to win tonight's draft lottery. Charlotte's at 12.5% and then Portland is at 10.5%. For you, as mm -hmm. like as a non fan of any of those teams, and, and Memphis isn't even in the lottery, um, which one would you actually like to see get Wembenyama? Like, just as a basketball fan on the Gary Parish show, you're talking about the NBA regularly, daily, practically. Um, which one do you think is just the best for the league? Best for like that you'd be most interested to see Detroit, Houston, San Antonio, Charlotte, Portland? Nada, we know your answer, GP, you. Which one of those five do you think would be best? Maybe having Dame, a running mate in Portland, would be fun. That's my although answer. although go look up the history of big men in Portland. I know, I know, and, and I that's know. scary. To that's... me, to me, it's Portland. I think Portland because of its history and the idea of Dame being the mentor for Wembenyama, and although it is a West Coast team, so he, you know the games would you don't have a central east coast time zone to me i think portland is the best story of the five if it were to win um if charlotte wins we might not have a podcast producer for the next three to six weeks nada let's get a quick thought from you as we are now t-minus about five hours to the draft lottery your hornets are 12.5 percent. i presume you have no optimism whatsoever that your team will win the draft lottery Absolutely not. Besides, the, the right answer for this, for who I want to see win this draft lottery, is Detroit. Cade, Jaden Ivey, Wembenyama, Jalen Duran. That's actually going to be a fun young group. As that would be awesome. That would be I, awesome. And he would be in the East. I, as a uh, fan of a Western Conference team with a suspended point guard, I would prefer him to go to the East. Um, but in terms of what I think would be so I'd love like LaMelo ball throwing lobs to Wimby would be fun. Um, but the, the thing that I think would be most interesting for the NBA, if you expand it beyond the five teams that you mentioned, yeah. Dallas with Luca. Oh my gosh. Oklahoma city with Shea Gilgis, Alexander, Josh Giddy, Chet Holmgren. 1.7% for OKC. Dallas is, is cruising at a 3% chance, by the way. Right. Those would be fun. New Orleans with Zion. Like if Zion's ever healthy and you get Wimbanyama and Zion, I mean, I don't even know what you do with that. Orlando, by the way, has two picks. Would here. be awesome. Like, yeah, but yeah. only the Orlando thing, I believe, is they've got their own pick 
Yes. To get number one. And yeah, but Chicago's is top four protected. So if if that pick wins the lottery, the Bulls will be picking, I believe. The Bulls will be picking first. Uh as someone who grew up a humongous Chicago Bulls fan, um Wembenyama would be the guy to get me back uh really back on the Bulls train there. Um let's wrap it. Let's predict who Who's going to win it though? We we said who we thought would be the best fit. Who? Nada, you first. Who's going to win the draft lottery? Who's going to who's going to be drafting Victor Wembanyama? San Antonio. It just feels faded, San Antonio. That would be fun because like you'd get to have I think there'd be a lot of I think there'd be a lot of eye rolling and groaning if San Antonio wins this. They got Duncan, they got Robinson, they, you know, I I I I'm not saying I believe that. I I think that is the least desirable outcome on the board for the general NBA fan. Well, you would get arguably the greatest NBA coach of all time working with arguably the most unique, greatest NBA prospect of all time. So that'd be fun. But the truth is, like, when you look at Oklahoma City, there's other stuff there. You look at Orlando, there's other stuff there. In San Antonio right now, there's just, like, it's not like you get Wimbanyama and you're ready. Like, they won't make the playoffs next season. They're going to be bad again. There's not enough there yet. So if you don't want to watch him be on a bad, bad team, you should mm-hmm. probably root against that, at least uh, at least for tonight. Okay, not a guess is San Antonio gets Wemby. Who is going to win the lottery tonight, Gary Parish? Houston. We agree. Um, I mean, it, there's nothing to I agree on. Agree. It's, a, it's ping pong balls <laughs> bouncing around. We agree it's, it's, it's not like we have any insight. We're just, I know, just like, I know. I'm saying we agree on our guess. It's just, it's, uh, it's, it's, just it's, whatever. It's, I'm thinking Houston gets it and the Rockets land Wembenyama, and uh, and that's what it, we'll be It's like about. this. It's like this. Hey, I'm thinking of a number right now between 1 and 14. What do you think I'm thinking of? 11. No, that was 4. I do this game with my 4-year-old. Got to be honest, though. No, I'm no, never going to be honest. Watch this. I'm thinking of a it's number terrible. right now. Between, I'm not I'm no, I want to play it. Well, play with me one more time. One through 14. Uh, I'll say five. I was thinking of 11. Liar! No, I really was. I'll do it again. One through 14, go. <sighs> Two. Seven. I was thinking of seven. Liar! One through right. 14, go. We're done. No, this is a good podcast. No, we're out of here. No, I, I got an email. They said we need to do more guessing games in the podcast. That's what that was. I think I read that somewhere. You and I got Houston. We agree. <laughs> Would like to see Portland. You'd like to see Portland. You know what, though? No, I don't want to see Portland. I would like to see. I'll go with not. I'd like to see Charlotte. I want him in the East. I don't need a. We got enough challenges here in Memphis right now. <laughs> we, we don't need a Wimbanyama challenge as well. All right. We got enough going on here in Memphis. Fair enough. If you'd like to know more about that, check in on the Gary Parrish Show on YouTube. Grind City Media. There we go. Good plug, Norlander. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Huck. Shouts to Larnell. Thank you guys for once again listening to the Island College Basketball Podcast, watching the Island College Basketball Podcast. (laughs) If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Uh, Apple and Spotify. There's more of us than there are of them. Yeah, I didn't do it because of this, but people in the chat are now saying because of this show's history, we just guaranteed Houston will not be kidding. Houston's got no shot. Houston has no shot. It's over for them. They're done. Houston's going to end up picking. Houston's going to have the best odds to pick first, and they're going to pick 23rd now somehow. What? The the Rockets will pick 23rd in, 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 in the 2023 NBA draft. If there's only one thing, two things I want you to remember from this episode, it is that there's more of us than there are of them. And Indiana has not been doing Elite Eight since 2002. You were doing it. Maybe this is the year. I mean, probably not, but maybe. Talk to you again real soon. Bye-bye.